my name is Mika Putterman, and I'm the founder and artistic director of Autour de la Flûte, a chamber music series here in Montreal. So here we are at the time of Schubert, we're at the time of Beethoven, we're at the time of Hummel, and we're certainly at the time of Kulau. Kulau was known as the Beethoven of the flute. These are two rivals. One is Koch, the other is Liebel. They both existed around the same time and had quite different sounds. Koch was described as having a very masculine sound and Liebel was described as having more of a sweeter, softer sound. It was all about personal preference. There wasn't one that was better than the other. This is a copy of the Liebel flute that was made by Rudolf Tutz. Flute music at this point got very virtuosic and was a very popular instrument. So a lot was written for flute for amateurs to play at home, but the music got quite difficult. So amateurs were uh, very, very well advanced, but there was also flute teachers at the Conservatoire de Paris who were um, incredible players. We're at the time of Reicha for wind quintets. So there was a lot of music written for flute at this period. Lots of chamber music for flute and piano. And the flute was of course very present in orchestra. This is a copy of a Koch flute made by Boaz Verney. Furstenau was very influential at the time, and he wrote a lot about alternate fingerings and suggested different fingerings and different passages for different affects. With the addition of keys, we get stronger sounds on notes that were traditionally weaker. Since there's so many possible alternative fingerings, the color of keys were still very present, as opposed to the boom system where we tried to equalize all notes. Does a Baroque fingering still work? Well, it depends on the flute. Some instruments you can still use a Baroque F, some instruments you have to use the keyed F. So this instrument is going to teach you what fingering to use, and then the fingering is going to teach you what color is in the piece. With the addition of all these keys, suddenly chromaticism was much more accessible and written into a lot of pieces um, for a dramatic effect. The flute at this point gets a little bit more powerful, but stays still quite sweet. So it competes a little bit better with louder instruments. In wind quintet, for example, the flute is just as equal as the oboe or clarinet. It's not a softer instrument anymore as it was sort of known in the Baroque period. At this point in time, head joints were lined with metal and often had a tuning slide in the head joint to be able to um, finely tune the instrument. This flute has a square embouchure, which makes it quite unique, as opposed to, say, oval or Baroque flutes, which were round. Since discovering the romantic flute, I've fallen in love with the flute again. I feel like the addition of keys was so impressive, and it matched the inventions and innovations in music so well. So suddenly a little chromatic note a little appoggiatura, you use the key and it gives it some sort of soul and grace and purpose. It's made me appreciate the golden era of the flute and all this virtuosic music that uh, is full of color and full of passion. For more information, visit autourdelaflute.com. Stay tuned for more episodes and more flutes.